I, in civil honesty, wish there was more I could express that hasn't already been done so about one of the most widely acclaimed all-time manga anime icons. Conceived by the late great Osamu Suzuka of Kimba the White Lion, aka Jungle Tante, Phoenix or Firebird, aka Hino Tori, Blackjack and Metropolis fame, Astro Boy, aka the Mighty Adam, Tetsuan Atsumu, was first introduced in his own manga back in 52, up until 68, thus of course spawning various media, running the gamut from countless anime series, which in turn also had the US of A, throughout each passing decade since its initial inception, a Japanese live action film, a Hong Kong American joint CGI animated film by Summit and a Magic Crystal Circle 09, merchandise including toys, and of course, isn't it obvious, video games. Games. In the latter case, what better time than right this very moment to look at the following? And take note, since both games are in Japanese, the usual on-screen translations will be provided for everyone's convenience. Tetsuan Adam, or again, Astro Boy, for the Famicom and the Super Famicom, on the former Circa 88 by Konami in association with Home Data, aka Magical Company, and the latter by Bandai's ill-fated Zamuse imprint in association with Minato Giken, Circa 94, respectively. <laughs> Hold everything. Quick round of shoutouts before we begin. Jeff Edwards, Mike Tessa from Stoneham, Jessica Felt, Roscoe Sargent, and the rest of the BitBar staff, Matt Lister and Becky Brooks from Dover, New Hampshire, Matt Michael and Sarah Rose Stone from Frank, California, as ever, Carrie Forbes from Quincy, Kevin James from Somerville, of Computer Fighters fame, not to be confused with the comedian, Jules Carozza from Gen Y Films, Bill Campbell from Insane Apricot, The World is Square, composed of Christensen, Edgington, Doan, Reardon, Corbett, and Borgella, Crunkwitch, composed of Brandon and Hannah, The Desaudio Brothers, Evan and Nathan, Joe Lubachum, Tryhard, Glentai, Sam Mulligan, S. The Sparrow, Composed of Amoroso, Hartshorn, Sullivan, Diamond Jones, Damon, Fonseca, Ariza, and Cleary, Ralph Sutter, Tanrith Munn, and Corey Valoy, Alicia Marie Sedlock, The Dead Collective, composed of Larson, Hannah, Brock, Tran, Harine, Fabore, etc. And finally, Melanie Long, a virtual reality graphic artist slash intern at Brooklyn Interactive Group. And not just this adaptation alone, but the next one yet to be discussed. You assume the role of the titular reanimated crime countering pine sized cyborg in the 21st century, aka right now, obviously, within which humans and robots coexist, modeled after the recently deceased son of Astor Boynton, aka Dr. Tenma, namely Toby Tenma, aka Toby, and following a brief circus stint with Kachatori, adopted by Dr. or Professor Pachydermis Elephant, or in other localizations, PBD or O'Shea, originally Professor Ochano Mizu, with a wide, if in the case of both adaptations, limited range of abilities that dare not speak their descriptions. In terms of gameplay, what could one expect but another standard action-adventure platformathon? Upon starting, a ruthless yet dopey-ass gang of thieves break in and rob our hero's mentor of all his cashola, and then some. As Astro, aka Adam, you're traversing from not only your main home, but also various other parts of the world, not only recovering said assets, no pun intended, but also sucker-punching the piss out of every hostile party in his way, minus both the finger lasers and the machine gun cannons sticking out of both his ass cheeks, of course, and even using various environmental foreground devices or communicating with supporting characters to further his intended mission. Aside from collecting as much coins as possible, other areas involve answering the payphone, upon which Dr. Elephant, aka Professor Ochano Mizu, replies, disseminating a living stone statue on the way to some faraway ruins into a neighboring town, acquiring necessary items, using his flashlight eyes to detect a dark underground passage, and even rescuing his sister, Uran, aka Asher Girl, and her other supporting characters, amongst other miscellaneous undertakings. Hell, even his trademark icing on the giant bowl of fried dough rolls rocket flight technique also makes the cut. Sure, it could be a star craving bitch to pull off at times, but in the long run, consider your efforts most rewarding. Now, here's what you do jump three times, via A, of course, while holding your desired horizontal direction on the D pad, left or right, provided they're well timed, then shift to up on your D pad upon the third button tap. And also, be forewarned, watch your TMP meter during the performance of said technique, because it'll run out eventually, in which fucking case, land early. Astro also has a uranium energy meter of 300, which also drains dramatically yet stagnantly in the style of Labyrinth the Nightmare on Elm Street. And should any environmental hazard or form of enemy assault happen to immobilize the synthetic little shit, Dr. Elephant, aka Professor Ochano Mizu, will pop in out of nowhere to repair his pint-sized ass, provided that both have enough uranium for said emergency. He can also be summoned by holding down and pushing B, the latter mostly used for punching, but only during the most critical time intervals. Shifting gears to the endless cast of adversaries, and the areas within which they occupy, they run the gamut from those very same bazooka-toting thieves, flocks of birds, witch doctors with bombs, floating knives, rats, spiders, snakes, toga-wearing Anubis conspirators, and honestly, as always, I can fucking go on for hours. Take note that while most of the human offenders get nailed, they'll end up spouting random gibberish, you know, just like both the manga and anime, regardless of the decade. And while the majority of them aren't complete dicks, they'll all but catch you off guard faster than you can recite the goddamn Declaration of Independence in 20 different languages. 
If all yours and the professor's uranium supplies run out, it's an instant game over, no continues, no mercy. How do you accumulate more, one might ask? Clear each fucking area without leaving any stone unturned whatsoever. But as expected, easier the shit said than done, hence the usual limelight of our upcoming subject, of course. Now, regarding the overall controls, they're somewhere in the awkward, cathartic, herky jerky territory in terms of the previously described rocket boot flight technique strategy. Of course, you can't just rapidly tap A, fuck no. But other than that, they're otherwise far from a ball busting migraine to accustom oneself with. Same stick with the rudimentary, if at times far fetched, gameplay schematics, for sure. Challenge-wise, for those expecting any breezy walk-in-the-park Mickey Mouse obstacles, consider yourselves piss out of luck. It's not just in the usual hostile party altercations, hazard evasion routines, or that rocket flight technique, about which, as usual, I strongly suggest referring the hell back. No way. It's more or less the exploration procedure, considering the traditional left-to-right progression, or vice versa in later occurrences, and knowing where and when to perform any related task in any given mission. For instance, in Stage 1B, I had absolutely no idea whatsoever that you had to knock out the fire-breathing statue's hand and face to access the next area, ring each of that very same area's bells in a specific four-tone-based order to progress, hence the auditory hints given before approaching each tier, like so. Or they had to avoid the first gap, you know, cause simple-ass platforming basics, on your way to the market district in the ensuing terrain. Fall in there, however, and you'll end up in a near inescapable Hell District area within which your ass is stuck for all time, in which case you'll have to either die or reset. Fuck if the latter. As I've mentioned in my earlier game analyses, it's moments like these where you have to rely on your own intuition, persistence, backbone, and alertness to entirely fulfill your given intentions. Shit, you can even purchase extra enhancements halfway through the game, depending on how many coins you've nabbed so far, whose quantity is displayed while paused, by the way. Must I mention yet again that there's no continues upon having both yours and the professor's uranium supply wasted away, let alone a fucking password and or safe feature, the latter two of which, uh, I don't know, could've helped a shit ton! All in all, the difficulty levels fair enough to warrant an near-successful run, depending on your intended substantial deal of practice, best judgments, and crystal-clear scrutiny. I mean, at least it's not much of a goddamn migraine, unlike some titles, we're looking at you once again, Battletoads. Yeah! Regarding the graphics, for yet another early to mid-lifespan Famicom game hailing from the same year as Contra, Gyrus, Jackal, 1943, Wild World, Rebel Warrior aka Bomber King, Legendary Wings, Bionic Commando, what have us. While the visuals are stunning, in hindsight they're about as bland as a puddle of goat puke, not that they're heinously appalling in the least. I honestly wish the facial expressions and foreground elements could have been improved to skosh, and most importantly, the flickering of the lettering would have been prevented, given the console's limitations at the time. Anyways, the usual unnecessary harping aside, the character likenesses are at least competent and faithful to the source material, and the natural, as well as futuristic high-tech backgrounds are fairly fabricated to an appealing degree, and that's no shit either. In terms of music and sound, while there's no composer indicated within whatsoever, of course my shot in the dark guess, or bed if you will, is Hiroshi Endo of Iron Skoon, also developed by the aforementioned Home Data, aka Magical Company, Maho Kabushiki Gaisha. Each of the scores are delightful, albeit a tad redundant, most notably the show's iconic opening theme by Shuntaro Tanigawa, heard in both the opening title and the first stage, minus the supporting percussion, not to mention a shortened fanfare upon clearance of each mandatory level. Everything else, however, runs the gamut from illustrious and alluring, to just downright forgettable and atrocious, and the less I say about the sound effects, the better. I will, however, narrow down my opinion on the latter, thereby going on record that they're on the same level as the graphics. Plain understatement, yes, but let's just move on already. Concerning Astro Boy and Famicom's replayability, if you have to, feel free to refer back to what I highlighted regarding the exploration routine and its applicable critical thinking strategies, in tandem with one other factor about which I neglected to highlight, the secret items, which are good for extra uranium upon completion, for instance, a random red mouse in the second stage, amongst countless others, which for the record respawns every time you fuck up. All of which, despite not having much in the way of boss confrontations, will do more than guarantee that you'll be coming back for more like nothing else, I might add. I consider myself beyond insane, conducting a regrettable as shit disservice by passing up the first of many adaptations of the late Tezuka's iconic pint-sized powerhouse. While the Super Famicom version of Astro Boy, aka Tetsuan Adam, is identical to the previous variation, both in terms of plot and gameplay, the latter of which I'll examine in a tick, it packs an entirely different batch of plot twists all its own. It 
all comes into play when old Astro visits an ancient Mayan temple within which his mentor, the aforementioned elephant aka Ochano Mizu, has been turned to stone. Of course, this turned out to be the handiwork of an all-too-familiar adversary, according to an ally of Astro's. As I mentioned before the gameplay, it's all ditto, just like the earlier Famicom offering, except there's more adventurous confrontations and more unexpected hurdles and pit stops that await our artificially advanced Avenger, or Arthur. Regarding the control framework, beast to punch and catch things in one top view area, ace to jump as well as perform a jet attack while hovering, or a somersault, the latter voice can once again be done in the top view area, and finally XL and RR are to fly to your heart's content no matter which direction you face. In True Turtles and Time and Godzilla for the NES fashion, selects for pausing unlike every other game out there. And unlike the energy counter in the previously discussed 8-bit Famicom variation, Astro's energy meter is now in the form of a customary 3 heart indicator. Like we've never seen that before. Shit. Get hit twice that much, hence the first heart turning red and then black for 2 damage points, with the same applying to the next heart, etc. And it's off to the old jackass junkyard for our little trooper. He, however, can extend the limit of his vitality meter upon acquiring a larger heart in each stage, if not every single one, as well as access further areas by knocking on a blue, later purple, magic button, thus summoning rows of support blocks ahead of him, and even lift up, or raise if you will, obstructing ceilings to further his quest while in flight mode. Getting back to the trademark Rocket Boot flight sequence, upon charging your desired button for a brief period and releasing, you're free to hover anywhere to your heart's content, but take special note of the indicator at the top left corner of the screen. During the boosting process, the indicator will display a bar in Apricot, followed by blue upon liftoff, and while hovering, that steadily decreases while in the air. Ergo, the same landing guidelines apply here, except you can do so at will by yet again releasing XL or R. Other items for Astro to get his hands on, aside from regaining his health via two types of cans I might add, one for two hearts, and another for the entire vitality meter, include a lighter to summon his sister Uron for acquiring either one of those very same cans, a temporary invincibility item, or an extra life, the latter of which, for the record, is the absolute fucking rarest. As far as the 16-bit adaptations itinerary, Astro's either exploring the following locations or engaging in the following field objectives. In the former category, the earlier alluded historic Mayan ruins, a haunted mansion at night, a malfunctioning space station, swimming across and under the ocean, a non-stop race through an underwater base, no rhyme intended, catching the missing bird belonging to Detective Gumshoe, aka Inspector Tawashi, another series supporting character I might add, in top view above the cityscape, concerning the latter of course, a dark cave, and finally the Sultan's Castle, all of which are, as many might expect, uniquely designed. They're getting to the usual massive lineup of adversaries and bosses. On the former, you've got living statues, bats, ghosts, living tombstones, golem beings, computerized orbs, energy given off by those very same orbs, fire breathing wolf masks, stingray shaped spaceships, snake warriors, and other miscellaneous rogue droids, animals, and or mutants. And on the latter, there's various defenders from both the show and manga, including the Sphinx, Denko, the malfunctioning space station's main computer core, and its guarding red attack orbs, a giant kraken slash shark hybrid, Atlas, and finally Pluto, led by the surly Sultan. While the former indicated lineup of hostile parties turn out to be complete pussies, you know, the usual no sweat duck super routine. The latter, however, except maybe for Sphinx and Denko, will all but guarantee your existence period will last only one third the average duration of a workday or a college course break. In other words, unless you master the hovering and jet attack techniques to their full functionalities, especially during the boss altercations I might add, expect those mindless, meat crop licking, dildo shoving, whale castrating, rectal orb pinching piss ant bastards, or the most infuriating, thought provoking field obstacle in human history to make it there forever bitch in half a nanosecond, and then the fuck some. Good thing you always restart at the beginning of each boss confrontation following your previous demise for the record. Upon fulfillment of either a recent boss victory or field mission, a post-stage cutscene plays out, after which the next chapter ensues, and by now, you pretty much get the gist of them. Taking into steadfast consideration how vexatiously ubiquitous the conjoined preliminary gameplay procedure and control framework can become at certain intervals, they're anything, anything but mundane. In fact, if I had to pick between taking a road test and getting the earlier highlighted aspects down pat, the former wouldn't even so much as compare to the latter, at least not in this case, but I digress. In comparison to its Famicom step-sibling, the challenge for Astro Boy on Super Famicom should come as no goddamn surprise. The myriad of struggles that you'll face range from fair and standard to just flat-out aggravating as shit. On the latter, they'll do more than bust your balls and send your Mach 5 into the goddamn red zone, thus driving your ass up a 250-story high wall! Take the second stage, for instance, specifically the previously alluded Haunted Mansion, featuring Shun Sakuban, aka Hige Oyachi, who's also Kenichi's uncle in Metropolis, and Skunk Usai, aka Fearless Fred Fink, or Slippery in various dubs, during which Astro's flashlight eyes are available for the record. 
Before reaching Denko, you have to go through a series of rooms without falling into a sudden loop trap, the latter result of which involves avoiding the flame traps while obtaining the larger life extension heart, as I stated not too damn long ago, raising the obstructing ceiling via rocket flight, confronting those duplicitous Tombstone and Stone Golem trio groups, and a pair of ghosts one floor down. Should you happen to get near the collapsing floor in the middle, you'll end up back at the goddamn flame trap room yet again, in which case, boost yourself up early before hovering over said hazards. Or how about the 6th top view cityscape area, during which you're tasked to rescue Detective Gumshoe's missing blue bird, while fending off all the airborne Stingray invaders? During said mission, you can actually perform a 360 degree air somersault via A to avoid any sudden chaotic collisions, aside from being for show, that is. Besides these, refer back to what I stated about the boss confrontations and the jet attack strategy, and bear in mind the usual perseverance tactics most would utilize in any and all platforming ROMs. Starting out with 3 lives, more of which, as discussed earlier, can be nabbed rarely, and 3 continues, don't get severely discouraged if you happen to find yourself incapable to succumb to these unrelenting conflicts. But then again, to quote Derek Alexander, aka HVGN, care of Stop Skeletons from Fighting, in his Little Nemo review, real games are real hard, just like real life. Now, as much as I wholeheartedly detest reiterating what's already been expressed about other 16 bit titles like this, the visuals are a massive step up from the earlier Famicom offering, but what the hell, that's to be expected from a Super NES game, or Super Famicom in this case. All the semi familiar characters from its source material and differentiating backdrops are larger than life, if possibly not that vast, and are very much livened and recreated to quite an entrancing degree, both in game and during the pivotal cutscenes, no less. Must I also mention how far from shabby the top few Mode 7 effects are in Stage 6, despite their rickety nature? Granted, the presentation is far from aged with something of a dignified idiosyncrasy, but like that's enough to deter any curious import junkie from embracing what this manganame inspired 16 bit variation has to offer, am I right? Music and sound wise, orchestrated and arranged by Miko Nozawa under the tutelage of one Matsudaira, as regretful as it is to put out there, the soundtrack pales a smidgen in comparison to its 8 bit leader. Now, don't get me wrong, the title theme for starters, obviously based on the show, kicks all kinds of ass. Sure, it's a vast improvement over the aforementioned, being on the same level as Turtles 4, Turtles in Time, and I'm more than inclined to admit that they've managed to incorporate an ominous and unparalleled myriad of themes. Having said that, while they are somehow lacking in quality, likewise with the sound effects, there's no question that they'll grow on you in a reasonable deal of time. And take note of my personal favorite shown here. Replayability wise, must anything more be elaborated regarding this distinct aspect alone? While it's not as captivating and astonishing as the later adaptations, likewise, yet again, with its 8-bit counterpart, and while most of the traditional platforming quirks have been done to death god knows how many times, in juxtaposition with the aforestated multitude of innovations and strategies about which won't be fucking reiterated, Astro Boy, aka the Mighty Atom, for both systems, including this rendition right here, are definitely worth ricocheting back and mastering time and time again, no matter which version floats your boat, that's for sure. <laughs> Therefore, my final verdict in a nutshell regarding these two adaptations, there are absolutely no words, no words to illustrate why and how they haven't been examined as often as necessary, nor did they bother to see any domestic releases, unlike two later titles whose names and descriptions I intend to keep on the hush hush, well, temporarily for the time being. Of course, my first impulse was for everyone to avoid both at all costs, unless you're a religious fan regardless of age, but being the equitable and righteous head honcho that I am, why not give both the Famicom and Super Famicom adaptations of Astro Boy infinite worlds beyond even our wildest imagination? Sure, there are obvious flaws with them, which again, I'm avoiding to go down Ditto Drive for the sake of time, in other words, reiterating them. However, their virtues far outweigh the ever-loving piss out of the former. Hell, even if you're not a religious fan of Astro Boy, I still wholeheartedly suggest trying both of them out for the sake of historic, as well as nostalgic, purposes, and then some. Until then, my beloved followers, this is the Hardcore Retro God once again signing off.